servant. And so we're, we're, we're going to speak this morning on the topic of pagan parenting. Now, I'm not going to show you how to parent like a pagan. I'm going to show you how not to parent like a pagan. Now, we're applying this to parenting. However, the issue that we're dealing with applies to all realms of authority. And uh, we need to understand that. And the Bible says, He that ruleth do so with diligence. And we're going to do that today. And we're going to explain some things in the Word of God that I pray will be a blessing to you today. Let's read our text and then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. That is a paralysis, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And sometimes in paralysis you have cramps and you have various spasms and things that can be grievous. Uh, of course, it would be grievous and uh, tormenting to be paralyzed at all, not to mention the cramps and things that would go along with it. Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Praise God for that. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is a prediction that many Gentiles are going to be in the kingdom. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This speaks of the Jews that had the message and had the promises and the oracles of God. And uh, many of them did get saved and received the kingdom truths, but many rejected it. Uh, and Jesus saith unto the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. God, we ask God for just understanding. We ask for truth to be proclaimed today. We ask for your Holy Spirit, God, to be with the preacher. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Be with the listeners today, God. Help it be applied. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to say, number one, isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus has authority? Isn't it wonderful to know Jesus has authority over everything? We're waiting for the day when uh, we see the full manifestation of that authority. But uh, he's going to exercise that authority one day the same way he now exercises it in heaven. And we're waiting on the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven to where he no longer permits evil. And I tell you what, that's going to be a good day, isn't it? Thy kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. You need to pray that. You need to be hoping and looking for the coming of our Savior. But even now, he invites you to cast your care upon him. And I believe we need to exalt Jesus higher than our problem. And even now, you can go to Jesus, who is higher than your problem and has authority over all things. You can go to Jesus, cast your care upon Him, and that's good news, isn't it? We need to be reminded of that. If this, serve, if this centurion was able to cast his problems on Jesus, why can't modern Baptists cast their problems on Jesus? Amen? He knew where to go. We ought to know where to go, right? We need to pray more. But today I want to ask two questions in light of Matthew 8. Question number one. Do you have authority where you should have it? And number two, are you submitted to authority in all of its ordained realms? Now I want you to think about that. Pay attention. This is, this is sermon time. You had all week listen to the radio and wiggle around and stuff. This is sermon time. Amen. If I was just giving a lecture, that'd be one thing. Do whatever, do whatever you want. But this is the holy Word of God. You're not reverencing me. You're reverencing this Word of God. Amen? But I pray you respect the preacher as well. Amen? 
Now, question number one, do you have authority where you should have it? Number two, are you submitted to authority in all of its ordained realm? Before we answer this question or these questions, we need to ask one important uh, question, and that is, what is authority? And if we answer the question, what is authority, we can go back and answer these two questions. Do you have it and are you submitted to it? So let's first of all look at what authority is. Now, authority, I believe, can be divided into two uh, aspects. First, there's de jure. And de jure means this, by right. Authority that is justified or legitimate, a lawful office. A man is the authority in his home de jure. You understand that? He has the right, the office ordained by God to be leader in his home de jure. A, a mom is by God put in a place of authority over her child. She has de jure. She is... A, rightfully, lawfully, in the place of authority. But there is also de facto authority. De facto means by fact. This is authority in fact or power, whether lawful or not. Somebody might have the might without the right. Or somebody might have the right without the might. And I'm going to put before you today... The goal is effective, practical authority. And effective, practical authority is not just de jure, it's also what? Say de facto. That's right. Y'all scared to say Latin, aren't you? You know, you're in a King James only church. They're looking at you like, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be saying that. Effective, practical authority. What is effective, practical authority? Lawful authority with power to require action, de jure and de facto. So you can have authoritarianism without authority, can't you? That would be de facto without de jure. That would be might without the right. But listen now this morning. You can also have authority without power. You can have legitimate authority and for some reason, lack the ability to enforce your authority. And if it has anything to do with the authority, God is going to judge that authority. If it's because that authority does not have backbone, then that will be dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ. Because He commanded us if you have de jure authority, then within your justified realm of power, you need to have de facto. You need to rule with diligence. Not be slack in that thing. You think God's going to give mamas a free pass? He said, I gave you the office of mama, and you decided to be slack in your parenting. You think God's going to give fathers a free pass just automatically? No, you can go to God for mercy and you can repent, but you better do it while it's time. You better do it in the day of repentance because tomorrow's not the day of repentance. Necessarily, it might not be. Jesus might come, you might die. So please notice, we're dealing with full authority, practical authority. Now, to this centurion, he only knew one authority. And wherever authority was to a centurion, it was both de jure and de facto. Notice our text. He says, I'm a man under authority. You know what he meant by that? He says, when my boss says do something, I do it. And he says, I have soldiers under me. What was his understanding of authority? Well, he said, I'll give you an example. I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he cometh. And I say to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. This man understood de jure and de facto. Why is it that lawful authority sometimes has no power? Why is it sometimes present only in title and letter, but not in practice? 
Let me give you the answer. The power of rightful authority can be seized by another power. That word seized is in our Bible under the word usurp. If authority has been usurped, it's been seized, grabbed, and taken by somebody else. And God's going to judge the authority that allowed it to be seized if he had any power to stop it. Eli, God says, I'm going to judge him in his house forever. Why? Because he allowed his authority to be seized, usurped. He was in authority over his children. He did not exercise it over his sons. And uh, he allowed it to be usurped. It might be because of weakness in the authority. Or it might just be an unwillingness to contend. A passivity. A nihilistic shoulder shrugging attitude of permissiveness. Proverbs 30 tells us this, For three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth. Your God says it is a wicked thing when you got a man that should be in charge allowing servants who should not be in charge to rule when they have not the de jure lawful right to rule. But for some reason, they have the de facto. For some reason, they are the ruler. You ever seen a house where you know who the de jure is, but the little children have become the de facto. They are the ones that have the might, though the parent had the right. And God said, He just gives you an example of something that is just so backward and so wrong. And that is when the servant rules the master. And there's another one that goes along with that, says God, and that's an odious woman. That's a hateful woman when she is married. God says that it's disquieted. Bad things come from hateful women getting married. Why? Because they rule their husband. They scream, they holler, they threaten, they go ballistic, they scream, they pull their hair out, they... they claw, they bust walls, they throw lamps down, they throw fits, they cry, they whatever. It's just an odious thing that's just going to stir up problems everywhere you go. God likes authority, doesn't He? You know why He likes authority? Because He established it long ago in all of its realm. He said, Lucifer, here's your domain. You stay right there. Have a good time. Uh, you're under me. And guess what happened? Lucifer didn't want to stay in his place. There were some angels. He said, you, you guys stay right here. And what did they do? They left their first estate. They, they left the realm God gave them. There's women leaving their estate today. And there's all types of people everywhere leaving their place. And God does not like it. He warns about it. He predicts it's going to come. And it's a horrible thing. So he says in 1 Timothy 2, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority. What does that mean? It means seize authority over the man. That means the man had the rightful place and she seized it and the man allowed it. Welcome to modern Christianity. Christian nice guy. But to be in silence. Are you listening this morning? You didn't come to a modern contemporary community church. We never advertised it. We never promised it. I never once told you that that's what you'd find in this place today. There are those who allow their rightful authority to be stripped from any of its practical power. Do you know one of the main reasons people allow authority to be seized? It's for emotional reasons. Did you know that? Emotional reasons. Adam did not allow Eve to seize authority because she had big muscles. That had nothing to do. She, she didn't have a hand grenade. It was emotional. God says the number one reason parents I believe one of the main reasons, I believe God's implying this, that parents do not rule their home, they do not have de facto authority, is because of emotional reasons. 
There is an attachment to these sweet, cute, darling little beings called children. They're just so sweet and they smile and they just give you the most precious little smile. They pick their nose. Stop doing that. And they, um, they're just precious, aren't they? You just got to love them. And there's something in you that says, I don't want to make that sweet little thing sad. But will daddy make you sad sometimes? He does, doesn't he? Sometimes. He's scared to say yes. But sometimes you got to take those sweet little creatures and you've got to make them sad. See? But your emotional being doesn't want to make them sad. You don't want them to cry. So God tells us in the Bible... He tells us, Proverbs 19, 18. Oh, listen, it's starting around the church. Boy, you know what I'm preaching. Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. You know what that says? It says, Mama, get rid of your emotional problems. Mama, get rid of your emotional hang-up. Daddy, get your thumb out of your mouth and get rid of your emotional hang-up. Daddy, start being a man in your home and act not only de jure, but also de facto as the man of your home and take care of your little one. That's what God said. Don't spare for their crying. You say, I don't want to make them sad. God said, I didn't ask you what you thought about it. See, God gave you a command. And you'll find soon enough God has de facto power to exercise His, his, his authority. He might be patient right now, but you'll find he's a little more de facto than you realize. But one day he'll be totally de facto as he comes and rules with a rod of iron. Okay, now we're ready. We're ready to ask question number one. Do you have authority where you should have it? I do not mean do you have the right of authority only. I mean, can you say about your house what this centurion could say about his servants. Test it. It's so easy. In fact, you manifest whether you have it every single day socially, wherever you are at, you manifest whether you have it. Here is authority. De jure and de facto. I say to this man, go and he goeth. I say to another one, come and he cometh. I say, do this, and He doeth it. Every day you manifest what type of authority you have. Child, come here to your daddy. If the child ignores you, you do not have authority in your home. You have turned the authority of your home over to your child to decide when it wants to come, what commands it wants to obey. If you say, go over there and sit on the couch, and it doesn't obey you, you don't have authority in your home. If you say, pick up that toy and put it in the toy box, and it does not pick it up, you do not have authority in your home. If it kicks, if it wiggles, if it cries, if you have to go over and beg it, bargain with it, Pamper it. Do whatever you have to do to get your child to do what you say. You don't have authority in your home. You may call it authority, but you're not the de facto father. You might be the de jure father, but you are not the de facto father. Meaning you don't have the power of a father in your home. Y'all listening today? The goal is to have practical, effective authority. Most people are like this centurion. Someone is over you and someone is under you. Let's take the mother, for example. Proverbs 29 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself, and then God puts this here just for you mothers, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Why is it the mother? Not only is she the guardian daily throughout most of the day, but number two, many times, if the father is not acting de facto father in his home, many times it's because of the mother. It's not that he doesn't want to be de facto. He's scared of mama. 
Mama doesn't want him to be de facto in the home. She wants him to be de jure. You can have the title, just don't exercise it. But this shows that Mama has a great responsibility to discipline the child. And it's in the context of the rod and reproof, showing that it's mama's divine obligation to use the rod upon children. I didn't say that God did. And mama ought to know how to do it. I fell under that Christian idea, so-called Christian, modern Christian idea, well, it's always the daddy's job. And you know what? That is so impractical. You're the one that saw the child not pick that thing up. You're the one that saw the child. I can't remember what, what this is for. I don't want to always come home and, and have to have a list of 150 things the child did all day that I got to whip them for. No, whatever you saw them do, whip them. And now I found a Bible verse for it. I knew it was ridiculous to begin with. I found a Bible verse. But I know daddy is the one that's in charge. And there ought to be a special fear about daddy. But it ought to be just like in the old community neighborhoods. It ought to be mama ought to get you. And when daddy comes home, daddy's going to search this thing out and see if there's anything else needs to be done about it. Notice it teaches the danger of being an un unwatchful parent. Don't let your children get far out of your sight. Do you understand that? Bad things are going to happen if you let children congregate together and get over there in secret. And you say, oh, I trust them, I trust them. Well, God never told you to trust them like that. God said, watch them, manage them. But you know, there's another way you can leave a child to himself and mama's going to be in shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Not only shame before everybody around her in her church and socially, she's going to be in shame at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, another way a mama can, be, uh, can leave a child to herself, leaving it to itself will. A child left to himself brings his mama to shame. That child has a will, and that will is to be conquered by mama. Mama ought to be just like that centurion. Say, child, come, it comes. Child, go, go. Do this, and the child ought to do it. But if mama leaves it to its self-will, that child's going to rule the home. That child's going to rule mama. And it's going to bring shame to mama. Because mama's going to be embarrassed everywhere she goes as her child throws a fit. I want you to listen now. Mother should be under the husband as centurion, as the centurion described. But she should likewise have her children under submission in the same manner. So I want to ask fathers today, and I want to ask mothers, do you have authority in your home? If you're married. Do you have authority in your home? Test it and see. I thought I had authority. I just wanted to make sure today. I, I got up and I told my little girl to go sit down. Get up. I said, what are you doing, Daddy? I'm just testing. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Get up and preach and not have authority in my home. On the little ones, they're going to test it. Not when they get a Tara's age, but Sianna's age, they're going to test it. And you've got to quickly show de jury, de facto. I am the ball. You obey at the first word. Not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth. You don't scream. You don't throw a fit. You do what I say. When I say it, immediately. First Timothy 3 says, One that ruleth well his own house. People say, Well, I don't agree with your standards. I don't care what you believe. My God says, If you're a pastor of a church, you need to have these standards. One that ruleth well his own house. Do you see that? That's from the Holy Word of God. I'm not being disrespectful to you. I'm just being respectful to God. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What does that mean? It means not only should your child obey, it ought to obey knowing Daddy just spoke. This is serious. Not just having your children in subjection, but having them in subjection with all gravity. If they're walking away from you, Talking back, shaking their head, upset, dragging their feet. If they're barely moving when you told them to go, that is smarting off. 
That's disobedience. That's rebellion. If they get down on the floor and start throwing a fit and go crazy, that's rebellion. And God's not just saying pastors ought to be in control. He's saying a pastor ought to be in control as an example to what you ought to be before God. For if a man not know how to rule, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? There's a certain amount of authority that the pastors exercise in a church and not turn it over to the whims and and, and, and that type of thing of, of, of people. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own house as well. How do you rule it well? Well, the centaur the centurion knew. There's a place for love, comfort, patience, all of that type of stuff. And I'm going to tell you, you ought to be in authority over your home. I want, I want to remind you also that the Bible says the rod comes before the reproof. It did not say the reproof and the rod give wisdom. It says the rod and reproof give wisdom. Mama, it was talking to you when it said it. The rod and reproof give wisdom. I want to tell you right now that this is why so many of you do not have, I'm not speaking to just the church, but those out there in internet land, that so many do not have de facto authority in their homes. This is why you talk too much. Are you listening? You talk too much. In fact, your discipline would improve. Your children would improve 99%, if not 100%, if you would just quit talking. If you would just quit talking, do not talk anymore. Hush. Walk over. If you told your child what to do and it didn't do it, say, how you doing? I love you. Or don't even say anything and tell it what to do after you give it a spanking. After you, di- after you discipline the child. And quit talking. There's a place for talking because it does say the rod and reproof. But too many people are talking when they should be given the rod. This makes you come down to the level of the child. This gives the child gambling room because now he doesn't know whether daddy or mama is going to talk to me. And if you're just going to talk, man, you might talk ten minutes. You might bargain with me. Then you're going to get out the deal. And then the playing and the distracting. The child learns very, very quickly, this is something. Well, I've learned to play daddy and mama. If I ever get whipping, it's going to be down the road, you know. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. He shall give delight unto thy soul. And it says in verse 19, a servant will not be corrected by words. What does that mean? It means if a man ruled his house only by words, sooner or later he's going to have problems. If he has no consequences whatsoever in his home, he's going to have problems. You can't rule a house like that. You can't rule your home like that. Your children will not be corrected by words. So what people end up doing is submitting to the little emperors in their home. Did God ever appoint them emperor? No, you appointed them emperor. You try to talk them into obedience. Where did you get that from? You didn't get it from the Word of God. You got it from pop psychology. You got it from watching television. You did not get it from the Bible. That's why I titled this message, Pagan Parenting. Now, after you've given them the rod, if you want to sit them on your lap, rub their hair, and give them a talking to, and give them a hug, praise God. But what are you talking about if they've already broken the law? What's there to talk about? They've already committed the crime. They knew good and well they should not do such a thing. They did it. What are you talking about? What I'm trying to show is what you've opted for many times is manipulation. And you're letting your child manipulate you. They try to distract the little emperors. They try to do anything but rule and take away the authority that they have unlawfully seized. Paganparenting.net is going to tell you how to rule your home. Spanking, says Pagan Parenting, is the controlling, disrespectful style 
of getting your children to do as you wish. Unbelievable. Spanking is hitting and hitting is not kind. If a child is not listening to you, stop. Notice you've got to do something. Stop. Sit down with him and talk. Pagan parenting. Is that Christian parenting? That's pagan parenting. You, you didn't get that from the Bible. You got it from pagans. Not old pagans. Not pagans like that centurion before he found Christ. Modern pagans. This is modern pagan parenting. Not traditional pagan parenting. Not in the days of Paul, where he said, we've all had fathers that chastised us. No. This is a new thing when he said, perilous times shall come. All the pagans are going to lose control of their home. And the church will be just like the world and will copy them. Imagine your daughter is hitting and kicking her little brother and she doesn't stop when you say stop. According to pagan parenting, immediately stop her from hurting her brother. Get in between them and protect your son. I guess she's pulling your hair and kicking you. But now you're in between and you're sheltering your... What if both daughters get in on it? What if, what if you got three sons and they're all kicking little brother? I guess you're supposed to smother little brother and they're all kicking you in the head and everything, but you're... You're a nice little pagan, so you're not going to do anything about it. If she still does not stop hitting, use your body to stop her body from hitting. Hold her hand or hold her so she can't hurt anyone and just wait for her to calm down. Pagan parenting! So now you have the child on the ground screaming, going crazy, and pagan parents pick it up and they try to restrain it and and everybody's looking, they're embarrassed, and they say, I'm going to go take care of this. And they disappear. You know what they do when they get in the other room? Nothing. They talk. What are you doing? Why are you being so bad? What's the matter? You want a toy? Daddy will buy you a Coca-Cola in a little bit. What's the matter? You want a treat? And then they come out, see, everything's okay. Yeah, the child's not upset, is it? But you sure trained it that it sure is good. Not only do you get a Coca-Cola, but Daddy freaks out and gets nervous. Boy, I can really stress Daddy out. I'll throw a fit, Daddy. Look, look, Look how Daddy gets manipulated. That teaches them to throw a fit quicker. So you got to chew. You can take pagan parenting complete with pentagrams all over the place. Or you can take Bible parenting. The sad thing is the blindness of many Christian parents. (laughs) I've given you the test today. I'm anointing your eyes with biblical eye salve so you can see. The test is the the centurion's definition of authority. How do I know if I'm a pagan parent? Test it. Say to your little one, go over there and pick up that toy and bring it to daddy. Thank you. Now go sit on the couch and don't say a word for five minutes and just read a little book, okay? Wait till they're playing with a favorite toy and say, bring daddy the toy right now and go sit down. You'll find out really quick whether you're just de jure authority or de facto authority. Some of you know you might have a problem, but you might see tree, men as trees walking. You might not really realize how weak, need, and mushy you really are. I pray God will open all our eyes today. There's too much attention today on child's imagined psychological needs. What your child needs is a daddy and mama that will rule them in love. We need to get down where the rubber meets the road. So the curse of Eli doesn't come upon your home. I tell you what, when you start all that child's imagined psychological needs, it leads to chaos. The world calls this chaos love. You know what love is according to modern pagans? 
chasing a little dictator all around the post office, all around your home, ruining your social relationship because you can't go anywhere now. You're embarrassed. Your children won't behave, so you can't go anywhere. You can't be around people. And that's not love. Let's quit bargaining. I don't see one time where that centurion says, I say unto the man under me, if you'll go do what I say, I'll give you a Coke. That's not in there. There's no bargaining. He's got de jure authority. And he's got de facto authority. Well, that's not humble. It's humility to let others rule you. Not when you have the place of authority and you're responsible before God to rule. It's not at all. In fact, that man lost the kingdom if he never repented in that church in the book of Revelation that allowed Jezebel to take over that church. And Jesus came to that pastor and said, you are being held accountable. I was just being humble, Jesus. Just being nice. No, no. I put you in the office to lead. I put the man in the place of leadership. Now, can you still lead and have humility? Yes. We should not be all interested in our own pride and that type of thing. You still need to be a servant, especially when it comes to a father and another father. One father ruling his home doesn't need to go and now try to rule somebody else's home. He says, having your own houses under subjection, not the house next door. See, Do pastors need to have servant spirit? That's right. Pastor down the street. I need to rule this church to whatever degree of authority the Lord's put under my hand. But the pastor down the street, I don't go rule his church. You see that? This is not love, it's soft love, fake love, secret love, but it's not the love of God or the love of the child. You know what type of love it is when you allow your child to rule you, when you only have de jure authority and not de facto authority? You know what type of love that is? It's self-love. You're loving yourself. God gave you a child and you're very thankful for your little Isaac, but now you've turned your little Isaac into an idol. Or your Isabella. Second Timothy says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, and this follows disobedient to parents. Isn't that interesting? When people become selfish and they love their selves more than they love God, then they pamper their own emotion. I just can't bear to see them cry. Well, that's self-love. Nobody enjoys it. But we enjoy the fruits of it. Oh, the Bible says if you chasten them, they will give you rest. Oh, praise God for the rest to be able to go to a restaurant, organic restaurant, and sit down and have your children behave and not throw a fit, not throw green beans to the person next door. It's a good thing. It relaxes you. And it becomes a testimony. And people come up and say, how do you get your children to do that? It becomes a witness. That's the goal, is it not? But it's in the last days, they're going to be loved in their own selves. Therefore, they're not going to discipline their children because they love themselves instead of their children. They love themselves instead of God. And therefore, their children are going to be left disobedient to parents. 2 Peter 2 says, there shall be false teachers among you. And many shall follow their pernicious, which means destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Notice in the last days there's going to be false teachers and they're going to assault the truth. Part of the truth is that you ought to rule your children with the rod. That's going to be assaulted and spoken evil of in the last days by these false teachers. 
chiefly them that walk after the flesh. Notice it's not they're not walking after the spirit. They're not walking after truth. They're walking after their own emotions. A bunch of emotionally charged people, females, in lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So notice the self-will, the disobedience to parents, the despising of government, all of it's there. And it's all rooted in, a, in the lack of authority and the fact that somebody somewhere is not exercising authority. The Bible says in the last days they will not endure sound doctrine. And the book of Proverbs is sound doctrine. But now let me ask the second question. Are you submitted to authority? Not only are you exercising it where you're supposed to be exercising it, but, but number two, are you submitted to authority in all of its ordained realms? Now, before you answer that, that question, I want you to look at the centurion and realize, are you submitted in this way? I don't mean halfway submitted. Wives, are you submitted to your husband this way? I say to this man, go and he goeth. Are you submitted like that? Or do you say, oh, I obey my husband as long as I agree. As long as I want to do it. I obey my husband as long as I terrorize him for a while, then I'll finally submit. But I'll do it with pouting and he'll sleep on the couch. But I'll submit to him. Children, are you submitted to your daddy in the right way? The quicker you obey, the better for you. Daddy better make you obey. But it's a lot easier if you just go along with it cheerfully. Are you submitted to God in this way? God says do this and you do it. That's what God thinks of authority. That's what God expects. No ifs and buts and whining. No delay. You say, I believe I'm submitted to God. Okay, let's test it. According to God's idea of authority, when the authority says do this, you do it. That's authority. De jure and de facto. Okay, God says give your child the rod when he misbehaves. Do you do that? Or are you very reluctant to do that? Do you let the self-will fester and become a cancer in your home? Do you have chaos in your home? You ought to be able to hold your child without the child breaking your nose and poking your eyes out and pulling your hair and going crazy. First Samuel 15, let me show you something about rebellion. It's good to be against the New Age movement, isn't it? It's good to be against Wicca and witches. But there's a lot of Christians who don't understand that in God's eyes, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And when God said, do this to your children and you don't do it, you're just like a witch. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And there's many Christian parents, Christian wives, people all around this country that are coming to church singing, Bless God. Bless the preacher. What a wonderful Lord's Day it is today. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really? God said, don't let your children rule you. Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? God said, kill everything utterly. Why do I hear some sheep? Or we might say, why is your child ruling you, poking at you, screaming, hollering, kicking? What mean this bleeding of your children? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So we obeyed the utterly just only where we wanted to do it. That's modern Christianity. Oh, I'm going to utterly obey you, God. Just in the realm I want to utterly obey you in. Whatever other realm, you know, just take this utterly over here. 
Samuel said, Had the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of ram. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, He hath also rejected thee from being king. When God wants you to obey, He wants the obedience exemplified and described by the centurion. That type of obedience. And God proves it here. He proved it in Lot's wife. He proves it with Samuel. He proved it in Eli. He proves it all throughout the Word of God. When God wants obedience, He wants it to be centurion obedient. He wants it to be de jure, de facto. He wants it full, utter obedience. Are you obeying God? Why don't we just give you, as we close, a few statements. I know there's commands all throughout the Bible you can test yourself with. But I just want you to test yourself with some things that are explicitly called the will of God. And just test it. The centurion says, I say do this, and he does it. Now test yourself. Let me give you the will of God today. This is the will of God for your life. 1 Thessalonians 4, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's it. Okay, if you obey God, then you're not hanging out with computers doing unseemly, unclean things. You understand that? That's plain, isn't it? There's no uncleanness on your computer. There's no fornication. Because God says not to do it. And if we're going to obey God, we don't do it. Here's another one. 1 Peter 2. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish man, where laws are obedient to God and lawful, you should not be unlawful. It's a bad testimony. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. No ifs, no buts. What type of authority? Centurion says, I say this and he does it. God says, be thankful. So you can test yourself right now today. How thankful are you to God? Are you sighing, murmuring, complaining? That's not the will of God. I say to this man, go and he goeth, and to another, come and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Malachi 1, we'll close. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. Boy, I don't know what kind of day that was. That wasn't these perilous times. But there was a time where a son honored his father. So God says, if, if then I be a father, where's my honor? And if I be a master, where's my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? He's saying, go obey your boss like that. Go obey your civil rulers like that. Give them the type of obedience you give me. Where a policeman is, all, is acting in his lawful authority, and he has the right to say, uh, be still for a second. Where he has the right to say that, and you don't be still. Well, today they'll just tase you or something. But uh, if you give the policeman honor... Because you fear Him, we ought to give God that honor. How much more? Serious word today. We talked about it a lot, but we just call it pagan parenting. To show you what you do not want to be. Come out from among this class of pagans and Christian pagans. And let's be different. Alright? we got to all be of one mind here with children. We've got to all be on the same page. The Bible says be of one accord, of one mind. And, and I know that we need to gain control sometimes if you've already lost it. I understand that. But there ought to be growth, amen? There ought to be pushing and growth. And I think there is. And I think it's encouraging. And let's help one another. When we see that blind spot in our brother, in love, if you see it in your pastor... Just say, you're going to let him get away with that? And that reminds us immediately. Okay, that's a blind spot. That can turn into a habit. If I don't correct that right now, that can turn into a habit. See. Let's pray.
Dear Holy God, I pray for repentance in this room and in all the land, God, wherever this sermon is heard. May it be your words, God. Will you please use it, Father? Take away anything that's dross in it, God. Take away anything that's wood, hay, stubble, God. But, Father, wherever your gold is, wherever your silver and precious stones is in this sermon, God, let it do a wonderful work in hearts, Father. Let some folks be broken in their heart to love you, God, and give you the submission that you deserve, O holy God. You died for us and loved us and given us this wonderful life and these precious children and this church family, God. Let us love you, Father. Let us be responsible with all that you put under our hands, God. Let us love them, nurture them, care for them, God. Encourage them. But also, Father, discipline them properly and rule them. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your love. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to change the course of this nation, God. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to raise up a new generation, God, where we have erred. Forgive us of our sins, God. Forgive the former generation, God. And let us raise up a new age, a new, a, a new time of children, God, that will grow up to be godly men, Father. We pray, come quickly, Lord. We thank you for the salvation in Jesus, the blood that covers our sins. Amen. All right, as the baptizees gather to the back room here, we're going to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? Amen. Let's stand up. We're going to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? Amen. Let's stand up. We're going to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? Amen. Let's stand up. We're going to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? 